I was born into generational Satanism. It means instead of being born into Christianity and God followers, or even um, being born into a family of atheists, I was born into devil worshiping family members. We were also being um, sold to men at the same time. I, the first time I was roughly, I was almost four. Heidi was born into a family of Satanists and was sexually trafficked for years, starting at age three. And as appalling as that is, it's just a part of what she shares about her life before she experienced a radical healing encounter with Jesus. Welcome to A Stronger Faith, a podcast that gives you a front row seat to the experiences of the presence of God that changed the faith and the lives of everyday people. I'm Stacy McCants, and it is the blessing of my life to be a part of these conversations. And you should know that we pray for you every week. We pray that God speaks to you through what you hear in these conversations, and we pray that your faith and your connection with God strengthens. What you're about to hear will likely be some of the most horrific things you've ever heard, followed by some of the most beautiful things you've ever heard. Don't turn away, because God is powerfully present here. If you're listening as a podcast with audio only, I recommend finding some time to watch the video of this conversation on YouTube. There's some images related to this story that we're able to share in the video that you will find impactful. The link to the YouTube version can be found in the episode description. Now, get ready to be changed. Please meet Heidi. Heidi, you are a Jesus follower. Absolutely. And it's been something that has occurred in your life over the last three years, primarily where most of the transformation has become evident. The reason you're here is because of that, but also because you, in your formative years, gosh, almost in your toddler years up through, you know, most of your teenage years experienced a reality that other people experience, but that the majority of the culture would find not just surreal, but like shockingly surreal. And I think this is a conversation about how God... There is no place too dark, no person too distant or dirty or too far gone or, or anything that God can't and doesn't go and get. And so I got to thank you, first of all, for being so, <laughs> so overwhelmed with God's goodness that you are willing to share the things including the dark including the awful to show the goodness of God Heidi thank you you good very okay <laughs> I'm ready <laughs> so I, I know we'd like to jump right into the the good and the beautiful and the amazing and we're going to get to it for sure I guess the place we have to start, though, is what, what were you born into? I was born into generational Satanism. What does that mean? 
it means instead of being born into Christianity and God followers, or even um, being born into a family of atheists, I was born into devil worshiping um, family members. Like active? Actively seeking Satan. It's, as Christians, um, we actively seek God and his presence, and they actively seek Satan and demonic presence. Okay. So what does that look like on a Wednesday, just in daily practice inside a home in your experience? Directly in my home, it didn't look like a lot, um, a lot differently than how and it was a pretty normal family um, from the outside looking in. Um, inside the home, though, um, I didn't. I didn't grow up with parents that didn't love each other. They love. They they loved each other, um, and I grew up with several siblings, and I was the oldest girl, so I was second in line, um, and that it was. It was more of um, a weekend issue. And a moon phase issue. A moon phase issue? Yes. How so? I didn't understand it as a child other than, um, as a little girl, other than the there was a lot of worshiping the moon and everything was at night. Um, but as I've learned more about it as an adult, it makes complete sense how and why they did what they did under the moon phase. Um, different moon phases. Um, if you look at the new moon, and I've learned this as an adult um, to try to understand my childhood, but if you look at the new moon, it's black and everything's dark. Everyone thinks, oh, it's a full moon, but the full moon is the brightest. That's not where all of the things happen. It's where everything is dark. So, um, but, um, and I'm sure uh, most people have heard of, um, a lot of women go into labor when it's a full moon. There are gravity pools and all of that, and darker powers go after that kind of thing instead of the Holy Spirit. It's demonic and worshiping the earth instead of our God. So I, I don't want to, ne- and I would say this all the time, we never want to glorify any of it, but we, we do want to expose it. And... um. So I guess we don't have to know all the details of, of everything that, that that looks like on a daily basis. But I I mean, this isn't something that this is something that you were born into, sort of in your in your family. Um, what did what did that look like? What did that end up resulting in or looking like for you? For me, I was, I was initially introduced to the sat- Satanism part of this um, when my family was building a home, and I was very little, um, just a little bigger than a toddler, and um, we lived in a tent while this home was being built on other family members' property, um, they, or they shared adjacent profit, uh, property. And they, to get a hot meal, like a hot meal and a bath, would take me and some of my siblings to another family member's house for the weekend. And that is where um, we were exposed to, like, the ritualistic part of it. What did that look like? Very, very dark. Um And I don't ever want to glorify what they did, but I think society believes that Satanism is maybe some necklaces or graffiti 
or certain tattoos with symbols. Um, but they literally worship Satan and make sacrifice. See, as Christians, we have Christ was our sacrifice. And they take anything good and do the opposite. So just imagine what we did to Christ. They will do to even an infant. Oh my gosh. And there are women that are literally used just to bring babies into the world to do this. You saw this? I saw this. I saw the making of the babies. I saw um, all of those kind of things. Um, and was forced to participate in some of those things. As a young child? That began around the age of three or four. At age of three or four, you were brought into these rituals of human sacrifice and of sex? There's, um, yeah, there's sexual rituals. There's sacrificial rituals, um, drinking of blood rituals, like how we take communion. Anything we do as Christians, the dark flip side of that. And you were exposed to this? I was exposed to it very early on as if it was just part of regular life. And... My Fridays and Saturday nights looked a lot like that. Um, sometimes just like chanting in dark robes and that, like, like they had church on one of those two nights. Um, I was little. I don't know which night it was which. Again, the moon came into factor. Um, but then Sunday mornings, um, you would be surprised how many Satanists go to church as a cover up. Go to Christian church. Go to Christian on church. On Sunday morning. And so Sunday morning, I would lay on the pew, exhausted from what I experienced the night before, while a family member would clean the dirt out from, from underneath my nails. Um, not actively involved in church, but definitely exposed to church. So this is, this is shaping you. How did it progress for you? I mean, this is you're you're a young, young, young child. I mean, how how did that shake out as you became, I don't know, seven, eight, ten, twelve? Well, we we began um also throughout this, uh we we're talking about the most evil of evil. Uh, we were also being um, sold to men at the same time. I, the first time I was roughly, I was almost four. You were three years old when you were sold, trafficked to a man. Multiple men. Sexually. Yes, um, just tortured. I had a speech impediment. That was a lot of, I mean, there's all kinds of things that men and women really will pay for. Um, some, of, some of it was um, sexual. Some of it was torturing me. And some of it was um, even making me talk because I had a speech impediment while they did sexual things with themselves as a child as a child okay so were these just anyone was this part of the the satanist culture was it with sort of contained within that or was were you just being trafficked at some point i was i was being trafficked um to people outside of the actual like coven other than 
the cult leader, um, he was the one who took me to these places. So he, I would say he was my trafficker as well, but he was also so into the dark side of things that, um, evil when people think of satan they think of like this the red horns and the tail and when i think of satan it is that man through and through hadn't he didn't even have color left in his eyes just black how long did it last the exposure to um, satanism was Really until no oh, sixteen, both until about I was until I was almost yeah until I was sixteen years old. Was this the only life you knew? Did you think this was life? Yes, I remember when I was nine. Um, I stayed with a friend for a week, and uh, my parents were out of town and. Um, my siblings and I were all in, di in different places, but I stayed with a friend of mine and um, they actually went to church with us and her mother was going to curl my hair and paint my nails and I curled up in the corner and sucked my thumb because I didn't want to go to the place where the men bought me. Um, and I remember doing that and her note, her her mother was concerned and kept asking me what was wrong and that no one was going to hurt me. But I realized then it wasn't everybody that was going through what I was going through and that it was, she could curl my hair and I wasn't going to be sold. And I didn't really put that together until I was about nine. And then I knew something was, something was different and that not everyone was getting hurt the way I was getting hurt. I didn't talk about it with my friends. I didn't, I missed a lot of school and I didn't have, um, I only had a, a few very close friends, but I, we didn't talk about it because I didn't think they would want to talk about what was happening to them. My sister and I talked about it and um, occasionally, or we would just, I had real bad night terrors as a child. Um, we both did, but my sister's a little bit younger than me, a year younger than me. And she would, um, after one specific, like really bad thing that happened, um, when I was about six, so she would have been five, we both agreed because we had learned enough. We knew about heaven and hell because we were in church, but then we also knew about the evil side of it. And we knew we wanted the good side, not the bad side. And we both agreed that what I had done would send me to hell. And so we began a thing at night where she would pray that if God took me when I was asleep, um, and she would always encourage me that she would cry, that there's no tears in heaven. We heard that in church one time. And so she would cry when she got to heaven and God would bring me up from hell. And this was as a five and six year old. These are your plans as a five and six year old of how to get me back out of hell because I was surely going to go because of what had been done to you, what I had experienced and was forced to participate in. And so she, I took my, my brother took a lot of the, um, abuse that I would have suffered. Um, and I took a lot of the abuse my sister would have suffered as the female side of it. And so she, she went on to dedicate her life to protect me. And that was how she did it. She would pray that God wouldn't take me. And if he did, he would just, or that I wouldn't die. And if he, if I did die, that he would take me to heaven and not look at what I'd done. This is so um, hard yeah. for me across this table to imagine. I just, it, 
it it sends a um a bit of a rage a little bit into me uh that makes me want to go get in the car and round and 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 we should feel that because this is happening today if you speak in circles of people who have experienced trafficking this is ongoing and it should it should outrage us we have allowed this to be hidden i guess and um so i i, I don't want to get too far down that uh, place of um we want to expose it for sure and i am so sorry <laughs> god i am so sorry and i'm going to ask a question later i think because of what we've heard that I think a lot of non-believers would ask if they were to hear your story. I'll ask it now, and we can readdress it later. People say, how can a God of love allow that to happen to innocent children? There must not be a God if those kinds of things are going on in this world. And I don't know that there's an easy answer. Oh, I think there is. From even the greatest theologians. The best person to answer that might be you, Heidi. I think um, what, that we live in, a, in a, fallen, a fallen world and there's evil men that have free will. And are going to do what they're going to do. And granted, I do believe everything has to pass through God's hands. However, I think about, I reflect a lot about Joseph was sold by his family. And he experienced all of that. And what the enemy means, if it meant for evil, God will turn for good. And I've seen what he just done in my life. And... I'm not comparing myself to Jesus by any means, not even, that's not what, I mean, I strive to be Christ-like, but I'm not him. But um, even more recently, I've thought, you know, not why me or how or all of those things, but God allowed Jesus to be crucified on the cross and what he experienced was horrific in order to help and save many and so I think sometimes when evil happens, or all the time when evil happens, he can turn it for good. And he will if you allow him to, if you're holding on to that and loving on the evil and, lo and holding on to it and not letting it go and giving it to God, he can't turn it for good. But if you will just give that to him, he will always. Well, he, he cares and loves us more than anything. And I know that. I know that he was with me through it. But evil men chose to do that to me. And, and women. The trafficking atrocities to the side for a second. The Satanist piece of it kind of separated from that just for a minute. It was all you knew for a time other than what you experienced in church. The fact that you and your five-year-old sister had a plan to get you to heaven tells me something about God tapping into your lives through all of that nastiness and awfulness. Because it was all you ever knew, was there ever a time where you participated in the spiritual side of it, trafficking aside, I mean, you're not participating in that. That's, but just like okay, so um, if I want power, if I want 
the things that come with the darker spiritual side, I, I'm going to participate. And, and I know that people that make a commitment to go in that direction, um, there's power that, that, that occurs. Um, I've also heard of people being pulled into that spiritual side of things, sort of not necessarily willingly, but having darker spirits um, attached to them by other people who are involved. Did any of that ever really happen in, in your experience? Two things that came to mind was um, when, again, when I was five, when I had um, this symbol was carved into my arm with a type of weird tattoo type gun of his blood. Whose blood? This cult leader's blood. And it was and it was like a weird gun type thing, but it was his blood. I know it was his blood that was being put into my arm for this symbol that was put. And it was bearer of illness, disease, and death. And and I, I heard those words being said, and I chose that identity for the next almost 40 years and became sick immediately and almost died my whole life following that up until about three years ago. Was this some sort of ritual that he was it doing? It was a ritual. There was chanting. There was a fire. There was all of this. But I think about I took this identity on of of being sickly and almost dying and death. And I took that identity on not knowing that's what I was doing as a child. But there's all of these demonic presence going on at the same time and all of that. And you fully believe that is your identity. And just knowing that's where it came from, you can do something about it. You can go in and just say, no, that's a lie. I don't believe that. And, and that's where I got freedom from that symbol. Um, but that, that is, um, that's one of the instances. And the other was when I was nine and I was, um, married to Satan, which is the cult leader. And I was married to him. And that was a ritual with many people watching him sexually assault me. Um, and I felt demonic presence enter me. Like I, I know that happened at that point when I was nine. With this man violating you. Yes. And it, and he said that Satan was with, was with me. And he was in me and I was a child and it, I definitely thought that's what happened. And I still believe that happened. Okay. So let's go back to the, the, the tattoo thing first and we're going to get to this in a second if that's okay. Sure. And at any point, if it's, you're done with it and you, you just let me know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I just want to, um, Understanding things spiritually and the way it operates, I think, is a big deal for people that are followers of Jesus. We see his activity of removal of them, and we know that we have authority. Um, demons know that the authority is with Christ, and so um, that's important. It's just how these things work. Do you believe when you got that tattoo and that in his blood that said sickness, disease, and death. Is that right? Illness, disease, Illness, and, death. Disease and death. And trade. That was part of it and too. And trade. Do you think you just believed a lie the rest of your days? Or do you think that a curse was laid on you or a demonic presence entered you? I think it was a curse and it was a demonic presence entered me. Um, Through that tattoo and his blood and the whole ritual and all that stuff think he was putting that in you. Oh, sure. And so the result of that was that you actually lived a life where you were sort of perpetually sick? Yes. Like how so? Um, within months, I um, got Rocky Mountain spotted tick fever and almost died. Was sent home to die. Um, and I did not die, but um, illness after illness. I've written them down before every diagnosis that I received the following 30 something years. And there's over 200. I have rheumatic fever, almost died. Um, lupus, I was diagnosed with lupus at 14. Um, it, it, you name it, every single system of my body was affected. 
brain aneurysm, strokes. Yeah, um, this isn't the flu. This is no, like I almost dying major over stuff. and over, over and over again. Tasted death. Yeah, you don't get brain aneurysms because you believed a lie that you're going to be sickly. That, no. That's that. There's something more going on there. Rocky Mountain spotted fever, lupus. Those are those are serious things. Oh yeah. That you don't manufacture in your mind and give yourself. Oh no, it's not. I don't believe that. I believe. I do believe that there's power in what you believe in, in what you believe. There's sure. power in that. And so there was no part of me fighting it off. There was no part of like I didn't I didn't fight anything. If a doctor diagnosed me, it just validated what was already spoken into me. Yeah. So I it spiraled. It it just spiraled from from 5 years old. It, it it really did. But with that said, I remember seeing, like, you know, once we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we have Christ in us, when, we, when that happens, you see things differently and you can view the world differently. And you see, you, you know when you meet someone at the gas station, if they are your brother and sister in Christ, you just see it. And you can also see the darker side, or at least I do. I'm speaking from my own experience. But as a child... I watched demonic activity. I watched demons enter people. I saw that with not my human eye, but as a, as a child, I saw the presence of demonic spirit. Like I see the presence of Holy Spirit now, if that makes sense at all. Can you describe that? I've always said black tar, black, just dark. So people see in the spirit. Right. People see in the spiritual realm, and uh, I think it's a gift that God gives people, and it's it's not an easy gift because you see some, it's like Janie Denny who was on here not long ago, and others have been on here. So, hey, you don't just see angels. Right? You see the other side in the darkness. <clears throat> Are you talking about the ability to see in the spiritual realm or were, were things going on in those rituals and in those times that caused you to be able to see that i just i just know what i saw yeah and i just know black. what i saw dark. and i just know that i know i saw the dark the dark stuff going i i can remember them summoning all the dark stuff in it and it going into even the cult leader and the power he got and that's the thing too is i don't think people understand you know Scripture talks about, you know, this is spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. Well, it wouldn't be war if there wasn't power on the dark side, too. I know that God's is more powerful. I know that now. But that dark side is, they're, they're strong. And it just is. And otherwise, it wouldn't be a war if, if it wasn't somewhat, not even, because God wins. But it's, it's there. Or, or it wouldn't be a battle. We wouldn't have a battle. And so I remember the strength he would have after that and how everyone else wanted it. And there, and it's, there is power there. Yeah. And yeah, scripture outlines that for sure. There is no contest between the authority of Christ and that power, but without the authority of Christ, without the presence of the Holy spirit, we are, we, we are no match. <laughs> we, we are, yeah. So um, interesting that you say that you watched that multiple times enter into other people. Do you believe that's what happened to you when he um, did what he did to you at nine years old? Yes. And married? Yes. And it gives it when it leave. I felt the dark. I felt... I thought if I got cut, it would be black, that my blood would be black. You felt it enter you? I've, I've, I felt it enter me, and I felt it until three years ago. From that night at nine years old, you felt it enter you, and you have felt it ever since until three years ago 
when you were delivered. We're going to get there. You are being trafficked. You're being sold to men and women, mostly men, who are doing evil things to you. How did you escape that? How did you get out of that? I, I told a friend of mine, um, we were sharing, I was almost 13 years old, um, and I was about to have to go stay the summer with these people that were, that are so evil. And I was going to be sent to stay the summer there. And I kept, I was very upset and I didn't have a lot of friends, but she was a close friend of mine and I kept telling her I didn't want to go. And I shared the tiniest, tiniest thing, not even the bad stuff, just that she goes, you can't go. You can't, you have to tell. Um, and so her and I went to my dad and my dad called the police and they got the FBI involved and that's how it can, it. So you were essentially others stepped in and, and stopped it. Yes. Until, until they didn't. It, I mean, I, it's still when I was 16, um, my trafficker slash cult leader um, did find me. He Again. found you? Yes. And brought you back? No, he sexually assaulted me and impregnated me. How did it finally end? I We got back in touch with um, law enforcement and stayed hidden for a while. Okay. As you look back on it now, do you see God's presence in any of those times? Absolutely. How? Some some people might. I don't. I. I don't know how to answer this because it makes me sound crazy. But as a child, I had a hallway in my brain with rooms, um, and I would go into the room when something bad was going to happen. It's. I'm not talking about split personality and alters. I'm no, talking no. about this is my experience. I would go into the room and sit with Jesus while the bad things happened. And he would shield sometimes my ears, sometimes my eyes. But these are different experiences. Um, I know what happened in my body, but there was protection there while it happened. And as torturous as it was, I know that I was shielded and comforted during it. It's so hard to explain it. I can tell you what the room looks like. I can tell you what what he smells like. You remember the way Jesus smelled in this room, shielding you from the depths of what was being done to you. Yeah. Can you? Will you? Describe it? Yeah. <laughs> I keep myself from going in there, um, mainly just because I can, I can also see the sadness of myself as a child in this yeah. room. And if you're uncomfortable with these things, no, he, certainly not. He's, he's beautiful. I can see his scarred hands. It's more down here. I can see... Um, His feet are callous. He smells a little musty, but kind of something else, like pepper, like a peppery smell, leathery smell. Um, 
He would cry while these things happened. He would cry with me. When some of the real bad stuff happened, I remember him covering my eyes with his scarred hands. And I don't... No one, just nobody can take that away. Nobody can ever steal that from me. People can doubt. And I'll even say I didn't know that was Jesus. (laughs) I just knew there was a man that comforted me. That is, that is incredible. And this was as, in the earliest times as well. This was through all all of it. Gosh, I ask you, this is such an important thing. I asked you earlier, from the position of a non-believer who is outraged at hearing these things and the thought that they would happen to a child. who would go into protest of God because of his inaction to prevent them from happening if he actually exists. And I'm talking to someone who lived in a satanic world, who was sold, who was given, who had awful things done, in the name of Satan, tell me that when the worst was happening, that Jesus shielded you from them, covering your eyes, covering your ears, crying with you as he shielded you. He even cleaned my arm with his blood after that happened. But I didn't know what that meant. I do now. He sustained me. He comforted me. He had grievance for me. And you had never given your life to Jesus or said the sinner's prayer or been baptized or all the things that religious tradition says gets us in his presence. None of those things mattered. He just came to his child and shielded her and loved her and cried with her and grieved with her and covered her and cleaned her. That may be one of the most beautiful things I have ever heard in my life. And I'll tell you, nine was a tough, obviously, we've hit nine a few times. Nine was one of the hardest years of my life. And I can remember singing the blue skies and rainbows. I don't know if you know that song, but um, there were a couple different songs that I knew, but blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see when the Lord is living in me. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. Do you know the song? You don't? I knew how long I was in certain places because that's the song I would sing. I would sing that song. I knew that song well enough from Sunday school or what have you, I knew, I knew that song and that, that was a very regular song. Um, and then the other one was, he gave me a song, which is, um, he took my burdens all the way up to a brighter day. He gave me a song, a wonderful song to sing about, um, and a, a wonderful song I now can sing in my heart, joy bells ring. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. Those are the two different songs that I would alternate with when bad things were happening. 
And I knew how long I was in a certain place by how many times I sang it. Like that helped later on um, determine different time frames. But I can remember hearing a little bit of like the humming of it. And I would know to start singing it. And then I didn't hear as much. Like all of those things. But I didn't really know that it was Jesus. Does that make sense? Like I didn't know it was him. But I know I had a protector and someone shielding me from those things. That is amazing to hear your experience of Jesus in the most um, unbelievably dark situations and not really recognizing that as him in the moment. Do you think... Do you think the fact that you actually were in church on Sunday mornings opened a door into any of the, you know, understandings of Christ and his love and the gospel or anything that would have helped be a seed of of hope in any of this? Possibly a seed of just knowing I didn't want that dark stuff. I wanted the light stuff. There was a light light thing. But then looking around and seeing people that were there the night before torturing, it left a real bad taste in my mouth. Like, what are they doing? What is this? And then hypocritical to a whole new level. And like I said, it, it, it's intertwined, the Satanism and the trafficking is intertwined because I would see a man that bought me at church and know what he had done to me. So there was a lot of confusion and not really sure. I knew I didn't want to be dark, but I didn't know what it meant to be light. And I wanted to be clean. I felt dirty from as far back as I could remember. I felt very dirty and used up and I mean I built my identity around that as well so there's I didn't know I didn't know what to do I was baptized several times as a teenager because I couldn't get clean because it wasn't about my body getting clean I I guess I thought that that would make me was what it would take because that's what you learn you've got to be baptized and you're washed clean I would get up out of that water and be so disappointed because I was still dirty Hmm. But I didn't. I didn't know what to do. So how did how did this turn into your adult years? What what did sounded like in the neighborhood of sixteen, seventeen is when you finally were able to get into a place where you were away from it for a while. From the age of I think 15, 15, I had a little brief period between 14 and when I was 14 and 15 where I wasn't assaulted regularly or any of that. And then I was um, sexually assaulted when I was 16, which resulted in a pregnancy. And I I have a lot of um, regret because I I didn't have an abortion, but I definitely did things to end that pregnancy because I didn't want to bring the spawn of Satan. I literally felt like I was carrying the spawn of Satan. And um, anyways, I went on after that to, I married very young at 16 and, um, and got pregnant and got away from A lot of that. So what did life look like? 20, 25, 30? I made bad decision after bad decision because I had formed my identity was that men were were allowed to use me. And I just, I formed my identity around being sickly and being on this earth to for men to take advantage of 
and it got me in a lot of bad situations. Mm. So this curse that you believe you were given, a couple of them, one at five years old with the uh, the guy's blood and the ritual and the curse of illness, um, disease. And then what you felt like was, well, you describe as a demonic presence that that entered you upon this ritualistic marriage at nine years old. Those things are, are those things manifesting themselves ongoing in your life? I mean, you keep talking about all the, you, you said you had probably 200 or so that you documented on the illness side of things. But I guess, so did any of that ever lead to things like addiction or other things that as you get older and more into life that it it turns into these other things i um i didn't i stayed away from anything that was going to make me not um present i didn't want to be um out of control uh, until i realized that those when, when i was in my early 30s i was prescribed pain medication for some of these illnesses and anxiety medications. And I um, realized that it numbed that, the the childhood trauma, it numbed it. And I didn't take more than prescribed, but I definitely took it when I wasn't hurting or when I didn't need it to keep that numbness. So I did, um, I want to say abuse as in take more than prescribed, but I definitely took it when I didn't need to. Yeah. And, and some of those are decisions and some of those, I, you, you just understand in, in when you begin to experience and understand demonic personalities and the way they affect people, um, there are paths that they're going to lead you down. Their end is your destruction, right? The enemy, he comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And so it's your destruction that they're looking for. And, and so I would think that addiction would be a place of that. Um, there, there's potential self-harm, all kinds of things that would also assault you mine was men yeah mine was mine was men it never it never changed it just didn't is i mean i got married when i was 16 and due to circumstances in my living environment he returned i met him overseas i lived back and forth overseas um but i met him overseas um and when and he returned back and he was preparing a place for me and um, I had twins and I was 16 and I wasn't allowed to move back and I had turned 17 at this point and I wasn't allowed to move back overseas until um, I was an adult and my parents didn't know that we were um, arranging that and the plan was right before or right when I turned 18 like he was getting airline tickets for for us. Um, and as soon as I turned 18, I would be on a plane with my twin babies to go over and he had a house set up and everything. And the month prior, so a few weeks really prior to my 18th birthday, I was gang raped and, um, it, that changed. That was one of the most defining moments in my life. It, I was brutally assaulted and um, it took over a year to recover physically from the trauma that happened from that. And um, that also could have killed me. But upon that happening, I told him that I wouldn't be coming there because I would not be a good wife because I never ever was allowing a man to touch me again. And I, and I ended it with him, which later resulted in his suicide. Oh my gosh. There is this 
black cloud that has been given to you at your, I mean, single digits that is following you. It is hovering over you, and it, it, it's not bad luck. It's a demonic presence that is destroying the things, um, destroying you. I mean, do you see it that way? I, I, I'm, I'm trying to observe it sitting across the table from you in, in what is our second conversation, really. But as I look at things from a spiritual perspective, it's just attached at this stage. And I don't know that you recognize that. Maybe you do it this time when you're a teenager. No, not at that time. I can't imagine that you would be able to have any idea that that's what that is. It would seem like, from your view, it's just life. And that, you know, this is what life has dealt you, and you're just bouncing around with what, however you're getting bounced in life. And, and what's happening is, is, is demonic presences are there, and they are... Um, affecting the things that are happening to you in your life and including your decisions. And it makes me sick. And um, I know you know that, and I know that you have encountered a different world (laughs) since those times, and um, and I'm thankful for it. But I just, it just makes me sick. And so, after these additional horrific things happened to you, he ends his own life because, uh, for whatever reasons, um, probably chief among them, the future that he had, he felt like he had for himself, was was taken. And, and it wasn't immediate that he did it. Um, I just, I've heard from his friends and family how he was found and I know that it contributed greatly um he struggled with addiction immediately after that and it and it led to that um and to add to the confusion of Christianity and Satanism I was now 18 and I was in the youth group at church because I was a teenager And the youth, the assistant youth pastor, youth director, whatever it would be in that religion, he kind of took me under his wing. He knew I had gone through this gang rape. He knew I was struggling with going through now an annulment of my 16-year-old, me being married at 16, and um, ended up getting it annulled because of the age being so young. And I'm going through all these things, and he knows that my home life is not great, and I've got alcoholic parents. And, um, I've got twin babies and I'm going through all of these things and we became friends, no romantic, anything for him. I'm grieving the only man that ever did treat me well, which was my twin's father. He actually walked through that pregnancy from the cult leader with me, knowing it wasn't his. I mean, it was a very short pregnancy, but he, he walked through that with me. He was an amazing man. And I was grieving like no other, my twin's father and not, and choosing I'm going to remain by myself Um, until things came to a head. So now I'm 18 years old and things came to a head at home where I was with my parents. And um, he had a two bedroom apartment. And so non-romantically, I'm recovering from this brutal gang rape. And I'm in, uh, I put my twins in one room. He had a room and I slept on a hide bed. And the church found out about it and said, well, you need to move back home. And I couldn't. And they said, well, they, you need to marry him. I said, I don't love him. And they said that marriage is based off of friendship and we were friends. And so him and I sat down and he, I was young, manipu- I'm, I'm very easily manipulated because of my trauma. Um, and so in my childhood, And he explained, you know, he had medical issues and he he was, he was several years older than me. He had medical issues. He wasn't interested in me in that way. He would never, 
we could just be friends and at least it would make the church happy. And that would be the best way for all of us to do this. And he would help me with my twins. No romantic. He would never touch me, all of this. And so we, we hugged when we got married at this little chapel in Reno, Nevada. Hugged. And he beat me for almost three years straight. He beat you? Beat me. He strangled. The assistant youth pastor. Yes, and he um, strangled one of my twin daughters. He um, smothered the other one. Um, and that went on for three years. Again, another, if I knew who I was in Christ versus who I was in Satan, that would have never been tolerable, but I deserved it in my mind. I deserved those things. I didn't I didn't know what happiness even looked like because I hadn't had it, other than that brief time period with my twin's father. I didn't know. And so my identity was in Satan, not in Christ. And so all of those things were acceptable. Um, when he did that to my twin daughters, it was not. And I did have a child with him. Um, so at this point, I have three kids, and I was able to get law enforcement involved, and they arrested him, and I was able to get away from him. And then I moved on to another bad relationship. But it wasn't. it didn't look bad because he wasn't hitting me initially and went on in that for the next um, 21 years. How did you come into relationship with Christ? So that's what's interesting is, is I would go to church, not all the time. I would take my kids to church and um, I sang all the songs and I was a fake Christian. I, wanted it, but I didn't have it. I didn't know. And at the sinner's prayer, getting baptized, I did all of these things. I taught Sunday school. I did all of that, but I wasn't saved. I know that now. I had, and the best way to explain it is God, God chooses us, but we have to choose him back. It's not just doing things. That's why when you look at scripture about, it, it's not about your works. It's not, it's, that's not what it is. It's, it's a relationship. It's a relationship. And I didn't have that part. I was doing the things some of the time. Like I, I was playing the role, but I wasn't, I hadn't chosen him. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. Yeah, but absolutely. That, that's, that's just how it was. I was a fake Christian. I sang in church. I did all of those things, but I was not. There was no relationship. I think that's probably not uncommon in the church today. There's a difference between participating in religious things and having a relationship with the author of life. And, um, yeah, that's important. So... How did you come into relationship? I'm assuming you feel like that's where you are now. Oh, for sure. (laughs) So, I mean, you've had a lifetime, and I would be willing to guess that in those 21, however many years, yeah, 21 years, that, that you've just, is a practically half of your life, We've talked about <laughs> we've talked about sort of this this first half, uh, and not even the first half. I'm sure that there's a lot more that's gone on here that that we could reveal the continued presence of the demonic and its attachment to you from an early age that's still manifesting its life. And if there's other things that we need to that you need to reveal there, then that's fine. I know that that's not where you are now. I know that you don't still feel dirty from my conversations with you. That Jesus did. Uh, that Jesus showed up in a big way on one particular day, and I I want to know. I want to know about that. That's my favorite part. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it really is. Um, well, for the next several years, it was raising kids and just getting by with life. And then 
Um, but the illnesses just got worse and worse. That's where the brain aneurysm strokes. Um, I had a bone tumor from hip to knee um, on my right leg, just sicker and sicker and sicker. Um, Addison's disease, which is a disease, which is adrenal deficient. Like I was supposed to be on medication the rest of my life for that. Um, just one thing after another, um, along with depression, anxiety. I mean, you name it. I had that going on pots, blood pressure issues. Uh, just, I had, um, hypokalemia, which is low potassium, constantly getting infusions for low potassium. Um, on the brink of death, on home health, hospice coming in, all of these things. Well, the medications eventually paralyzed my stomach and I developed gastroparesis and got a feeding tube administered um, and a port in my chest as well. And um, I got the the feeding tube the beginning of 2019 and everything went black. I would get little, there were little snippets here and there, but everything was basically black um, until I was put into the hospital. Um, I do remember at one point in the middle of the blackness, a tube being removed from my throat and I had been in a coma and they had told me that. Um, I didn't know how, I didn't know any details other than I was f so afraid. I was very afraid for my life, but I didn't know and then it was black again. Like there's not anything. So you have no memory of this time? Nothing, no memory and I didn't, I mean, I didn't even know I didn't have a memory because I was completely asleep. I didn't know. Were you, all right, when you say asleep, are you talking about just, this is a season that you were in sickness and you can't recall or were you like in the hospital in a coma? Or? I didn't know. I didn't know. I just know that I was being hospitalized. My son and daughter were taking me to the hospital to get admitted because I was having seizures. And the day prior, um, my ex-husband had taken me to get a COVID test because I was being admitted into the hospital the next day and then it gets black again. And then now my children are taking me to the hospital and I'm going to be admitted into the neurology department at UAB for who knows how long. But the seizures were too close together and, again, fearful for my life. And I'm admitted in, into this the neurology department. And they're, they do like a urine test, blood work, and all of that. And while they're hooking all these, I'm hooked up to every kind of thing you can imagine, like the, the, the heart monitor, EEG, EKG, all of that. And they actually wrap it in like a cast type thing on your head so it can't come off if you're having a seizure. And they're hooking all this up, and the doctor came in and said, you have alcohol in your urine. And I was like, how? And he goes, well, you tell me. And I was like, I have no idea. Um, I said, my stomach is paralyzed. How would there be alcohol in my urine? And he said, you tell me. And I said, I, I really don't know. I don't remember anything. And he said that I had end-stage liver failure and that I was going to die. This is the, the last day of November of 2020. He said that even if I went off of all my medications, that he didn't promise me Christmas. And I said that I was scared. I didn't know why there was alcohol in my urine and why all my blood work looked like that and why I was dying. And that I wanted to go off all of my medicines so I could wake up. And he agreed that that was the logical thing to do. Um, in fact, we decided to go off of more than one page of medications cold turkey since I was being monitored and they could stop seizures because that was the greatest fear you know if you go off those kind of I'm talking morphine fentanyl like you named the medications and I was on them um, anxiety medicines nerve medicines muscle medicines um, I was on a, a lethal cocktail of medications and so we went off of it cold turkey and um to try to get to the bottom of what was going on with the seizures and so that I could wake up and try to remember why I'm missing two years of my life. And on that third day, which was December 3rd of 2020, I couldn't sleep. I was miserable, miserable from the detox. Um, my resting heart rate, 
two years prior before I ever got the feeding tube was 150 and it was still 150 while I'm laying in this hospital bed, resting, not moving at all. Um, I was so sick, um, fever. Um, I, I, cu I couldn't sleep. I was crawling, my skin was crawling from the detox and the withdrawals. And I just said, I don't know who I was even calling out to at this point. But I just said, how did I get this way? How did I get right here to this point in my life where I don't even know two years of my life? How do I not know why there's alcohol in my urine? How do I not know what my kids look like right now? How am I wearing a diaper with no idea how I got to this point? How am I unable to walk? How do I not know anything going on in my life? How did I get to this broken point? And then I just started yelling, show me. Show me. Tell me how. Tell me. And it was like God pushed play at me being born. And everything went really, really fast. But it would slow down at all of the moments that changed me. So I saw myself being born. I saw my dad. I saw, I saw all of these things. And then it was being taken from this tent to my family member's house um, and seeing all of these things. And it would slow down just enough to show me why it changed me and where it changed. And it was throughout everything. The things I told you, things I haven't told you, good things and bad things. Some of it was my kids being born. Some of it was things that I didn't remember. Some of it was some of those moments in those two years that I didn't remember prior. But it all led up to me in that hospital bed in that moment. Um, and I just started screaming, no, no more. I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I can't even tell you what I yelled because it was wailing. It wasn't really anything. Um, it was feelings coming out, not so much words. But I know what I felt. I know what I was saying to myself is, how do you know more? No, get up. Get up. And I think about when, you know, to when pick up your bed and walk. <laughs> like the, I think of that part a lot of... Um, Anyways, I, I, the bed was padded and I, I draw and I was being videoed during this whole thing, um, because they're monitoring me because of these, the seizure activity. And now I've withdrawn off of toxic medications and I'm, I mean, it's a dangerous situation, but I, I lowered the guardrail of the bed and took the padding off and put it on the floor and I crawled down onto that floor. And now I know I didn't have to, but I felt every bit of me doing, needing to do that. And I got down on my knees and I. I did not say a special prayer. I did not say, dear Lord. I just directly. And I, let me tell you, those doctors, they came running in there. And I just held my hand up. And they left me alone. They left me alone. I just held my hand up and they stood there. I can't tell you what they were doing. Because it was literally me pouring everything out. It wasn't me begging for forgiveness for any of the things that I had done because as soon as I wailed, God washed me. The washing I wanted every time I got baptized. And how he made me clean as it left, he washed me. And things just left and he washed me. And I knew I was his. And I knew, I knew that I was his and I knew he was mine. I knew that that was, that it was, different and it was changed and I was changed in my situation I knew I would never be the same I knew that it was over I knew that that nothing could touch me I knew all of these dark forces coming against me were gone I knew that the tar was gone my blood was red I knew it was Christ's blood was in me it wasn't this demonic stuff in me and I knew it and it was instant and the cool thing, I felt the illnesses and diseases leave. I felt everything leave. And 
the heart monitor that was 150 just rapidly going was just slowly, slowly slowing down as it left. And other than when I deliberately work out, it has not gone over 75, 80 since then. I mean, my heart rate came down. I got back up. I don't know how long I was on that floor. I have no idea. But I got back up in that bed. And what we thought was going to be a several week, if not months stay, I was able to leave the next day and go home. I was able to go get in the shower for the first time um, by myself that I was aware of. That's what my family had told me, my children on the way. Um, but I, I, it, everything changed in that moment. Everything completely changed. You were healed? I was healed, radically healed. You believe you experienced deliverance? As you might know, deliverance ministry of demonic things. You think you got the package deal? Yes. Right there on that hospital I know floor? I did. And that's something like when I talk about where Jesus was when all the things happened, this is, if not a bigger experience for me. I know every nothing has been the same since. The bone tumor completely gone. I have x-ray before and after gone your i have not rate, taken medication your heart rate that had been steady at resting 150 for how long before that years years before that years in that moment began to drop yeah it dropped while i was pouring that out still on the floor still on the floor and it dropped did you confess that you were a sinner during that prayer did you ask jesus to come live in your heart did you nothing I didn't do any of that. I literally welled it out and he washed me. And that is something nobody can steal from me. Either. That is fantastic. <laughs> I gotta tell you. Cause we think there's this procedure we gotta go through mm-hmm. before we're saved and God writes us a ticket to his peace in heaven, and I don't think it's right either. No, the procedures is what I did for 21 years. And that got me nowhere. I said the prayers. I got baptized. I went to church. I did all the things that religion says you need to do. Went all along. And I say that God was reaching. He was reaching for me the whole time, but I just had to grab. I had to reach back and grab his hand. And I know that. But I didn't do that part. That's what I didn't do. And that's what you feel like. I know. He, in that hospital, it sounds like you, it was suddenly pressed on your heart in a powerful way that this got us, this is it. This is now is it. And, and you got off of that bed. And onto the floor. It sounds like when you talk about the wailing and sound, this crazy sound and all this other stuff, you felt like things were coming out of you. I know they were. I know that they were. That was the darkness. That was the demonic presence. That was what entered you, the sickness, and the illness, disease, and death. That came out. It all, Yes that was put into you at five years old. Being Satan's bride. And the Satan's bride stuff that was put into you at nine years old that you felt come upon you and stayed in you for 30 some odd years. You felt it come out. Yes. On a hospital floor. Yes. Without a preacher around. Right. Without a special prayer. Right. Just bare and before God and Him cleansing you. That is absolutely beautiful. And that is absolutely the the God I know, the Jesus I know, getting down in, in the uncleaned 
areas of life, in the unsanitized, where we clean things up and we think that, you know, everybody gets dressed up on Sunday morning and um, take pictures afterwards and baptisms and lunch and nothing wrong with all those things. But there is a raw, real version that's really where he... In the hospital floor. <laughs> that's where he is. Oh, my God. And this lifetime of just the most horrific abuse imaginable that outrages any non-evil person cleaned. What an experience. And then he, God went on to restore. So during those two years, relationships with my now adult children were just severed. There, there is a lot of details that went into what had happened in those two years of why I don't remember them, um, which I'm not going to discuss because there's criminal charges pending for mm. my ex-husband. Okay. And that's fine. But I don't want to discuss the details. But my children had all kind of walked away from me during those two years or from us during those two years or three yeah two years and god has not just only restored it it's it's how restored everything is it's how my life looks now and i'm not saying everything's easy because it's not but the complete peace and happiness and knowing now there was still work to do to go in and realize where you know there's still work to do with, you know, and, and I, I know that we're a work in progress and in, in, in terms of like triggers and that kind of stuff, there's still that childhood trauma that needs to be addressed. But as a whole, I don't have that demonic presence. I know that I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and there's not room for both. And I know that. And I, and I don't know how I even went through my life without his presence. I don't know. And I had his presence, but I mean, being filled with the Holy Spirit is entirely different than what I was filled with prior to three years ago. And, so you, that's, and you like, <laughs> this isn't a, uh, a thing that's for debate for you, right? There's a no. clear, it's like, no, it was so dark and so black and, and it is so not that now it is a, it is a night and day. Yeah. And everyone says, I mean, anyone that, sees me now I mean some a lot of I mean I'm not kidding when people I haven't seen in years like five years see me they're like I thought you were dead you lived and and everyone just comments about how I have so much light around me like I mean it, it, people tell me this all the time and that I'm not the same person and I'm like I know <laughs> I know this you don't have to tell me I know I'm not the same I know that I'll never be the same as I was then I mean, this is entirely different, and I'm, and I. That's why I now try to help people with. That's what I do. Is I try to help people um, that are stuck in that place. It's no, you don't have to go to church with me. No, I'm not going to make you repeat this prayer. I'm not going to do any of that stuff because it's. It, you have to choose them back, and just cut to the chase of it because. If you can simplify it, it changes everything. Because you, you think you have to do all of these certain things, and he just wants us to choose him back. That's it. He's reaching for every one of us. He's reaching for that cult leader. He's reaching for everyone. You just have to reach back and grab his hand and not let go. And so, I, I mean, that's I'm not above going to. There were no wounds. My wounds were dirty and ugly and that wasn't too much for him so there are no wounds that I'm afraid to touch either because we're supposed to be the hands and feet of Christ and I will go into wherever that is and get people out of situations where they're being trafficked or where they're struggling with addiction or in abusive marriages where they feel like there is no hope and I just I strive to do that not for recognition but because come here let me show you this is this is the answer. You can do all of those things, but this is the answer. There are people that don't believe that God is real. Lots of people. 
it's uh, become a, a trendier um, reality, I guess, over the last 60 or so years that I think we feel like we've gotten a little too um, intelligent to buy into and to buy into that sort of thing anymore. I think a lot of the intellectual elite snicker at the thought that there would be people who still believe that there is a supernatural being, God, that there's like people that actually think that there's a devil, you know, and there's hell and all that other stuff. It sounds absurd and quite frankly ridiculous to a lot of people who think they're a lot smarter and more sophisticated than that these days. What do you say to them? Try it. They're trying everything else. Um, that's one of the things that I say is give it. You've tried all these other things. Give this a try. Get to know them. Like open your heart and get to know them. And if, and if nothing happens, then nothing happens. That's what I say. And you just can't dispute. I show pictures of my before and after. That is a huge testimony in itself of where I was and, and where I'm at. And science didn't do that. Pills and drugs didn't fix it. Doctors didn't fix it. Psychiatrists didn't fix it. The world did not fix it. God fixed it. And and people that see the difference can't dispute it. I mean, it's just, I don't say I'm going to pray for you because I think that that's not, I think that's a religious issue as well. Um, I do pray for them, but I don't cram Jesus down their throat because that's not going to help the situation. I think as Christians, we think we're helping, but we're not. Um, the scripture says we'll know, they'll know we're Christians by our love, not by us cramming it down their throat or by our business card or by what, you know, it's by our love. And you just love them and meet them where they're at. Because if you'd met me 10 years ago, you'd have nothing to do with me. Or 15 years ago, you'd have, you have to meet people where they're at. And if they, usually it's an issue of bitterness anyways, if they don't believe in God because they know God. God knew us before we were created. Yeah. And we knew him. We're born with knowledge of God in our heart. We are. So what takes that out is a hardened heart. And what softens a hardened heart is love. And you just have to love him. That is fantastic. It is. And it is not religion. It is God. And it's not the same thing. And uh, you know, I just look at at your situation, I always try to create, I don't even know that I can manufacture this. I always try to create a scenario where I'm a skeptic or I'm a non-believer. I'm a, a non-follower. It's like, okay, what's my argument? What's my case that what changed Heidi was not God? Okay. So she had been in detox for three days. All the medication is why her blood or her heart rate was high, came off, and had an emotional experience as she was awakened from all of that and attributes that to God. Is that possible? No. Where's the bone tumor? Where's the bone tumor? Where's the bone tumor? Um, even if you blamed everything on medication, I'm, uh, it's hard because I know what happened in my heart. And there's and you can't even put it into words because it wasn't worldly. It was spiritual. So you can't even put it into earth words like you can't. Um, when you know, you know. I don't know. You can't. Repentance is huge. It's like turning away and like there's studies, scientific studies on the brain and even what repentance looks like in the brain. And you go away from the old and into a new, you have a new way of thinking 
and a new way of, and, and I know all of those things occurred at the same time. So I'm probably not answering your question other than my heart grieves for people that haven't experienced it. And I do believe even atheists and Satanists, they, Satanists believe in God or they wouldn't be summoning dark spirit. They know Satan and they know, they know God, they know. And I think I really do believe everyone believes in God, whether who knows what they call them. They don't, I mean, but I think everyone has knowledge of God. And even as a child, like I said, I didn't know that was Jesus that was with me. But I knew it was light. I knew that much. I knew that it was the opposite of what I was experiencing. Because that's the only thing that light is, that his light is the only thing that is more powerful than that darkness. Is the only thing. And people have to know that. I think they deny it, but I think everybody knows it. I really do. Your darkness was darker than most by a long shot, but people are still living in darkness. And you can contrast it. And and to watch you contrast it is powerful. You you had an opportunity to... (laughs) It's like, uh, are are you wet or are you dry? Have you had a mist sprayed on you. It's like, I, I, I don't know. Maybe I, I was really never wet. I just had a mist on me or whatever, but you were submerged. You were, you were underwater. And so you know what it's like now to be out of that water and breathing and dry. And it's just a, you just got a big contrast. And, um, I think it's, I think it's super powerful. Um, I think you lived with, uh, with some darkness some substantial darkness in you for, I don't know, 30, 32 years, whatever it is. And you had, and it wasn't a gradual transition out of that. Some people is, or some people it is, it wasn't gradual. It was, it was in a moment. You were, blacked out for two years, seizures, tumor, medication, and the day after you walked out of the hospital. I don't know. I don't know how you um, account for that outside of God. You can't. (laughs) I'm sure there's ways to do that, but I think it's a stretch. Some of it's not quite a stretch. I think this is a, that, that's a that'd be a huge stretch for somebody to say, yeah, that's. And so, it's like okay, if you are describing this, and even if you're not, um, in a dark cycle of deep darkness and Satanism, but if 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 you're living a life of unpeace. Um, discontentment you've got dark areas maybe they're not as dark as what was described today but if 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 you know I, I don't feel that um, overwhelming cleanness that Heidi feels but you know I'm not addicted to anything I don't have an abusive relationship got a good job you know Life's okay. I'm not sure I'm really happy or content, but I think it's in those areas where I I, I get saddened because people don't think they are in darkness. They think they're just in in life. But those who are walking truly in the light that is connection to God, active, ongoing connection in the love of God and you know it you can feel it you know it um it's that it's that space that gets me concerned for people that breaks my heart I mean your story obviously breaks our hearts um from where you were but it's in the people that don't know they're in the darkness but they still don't feel that contentment what do you say to them I mean what what would you say even to those folks 
I always try to, because that's what I do on a day to day, really. Um, I always try to acknowledge their hurt. Because a lot of the time, people in those situations just need to be seen. They're not feeling seen. And as soon as you acknowledge their existence and show them the love of Christ through you, that it, if they can't connect with God, they can see Christ in you. Even if that's even if they don't know, I go back I, again to my childhood. I didn't know that was Jesus, but I knew that's where I needed to be. And even if people don't know what they're seeing in us as Christians, truly living in the light, even if they don't know that it's Christ, they know it's where they need to be. They know it's light. They know that's where they need to be. And sometimes it's just being an example, and sometimes it's it's very rarely throwing scriptures at them mm-hmm. for them to get better. That's harmful at that point. It's really acknowledging. The first thing I say when I get to someone that's been through trauma or in a crisis or even what you're talking about, just in a dark place that don't even know it. I can't tell you how many of my children's friends. I just, it's just all I say are three words. I see you. I see you. Because the Holy Spirit in you sees it. And so if you can see that darkness in someone, just to say, hey, I see you. I can remember a woman saying that when I was little. She didn't help me. She didn't rescue me. But she said, I see you. And it, she didn't rescue me. But that is a seed that was planted that I grabbed onto. Because to just be acknowledged as a human being, and that's hurting. A hurting human being. Um is really people just want to be seen and they want to be heard. And once you get through that part right there, you've already planted a seed just by seeing someone. And then you bring that light to them. You don't have to cram it down someone's throat. Or how can I help? Not, it doesn't have to be how, how I'm praying for you. That's not helpful for a lot of people. I pray for everyone. But to say it to someone that's hurting when they might just need a hug. So what are you doing now? I'm a victim advocate for domestic abuse, sex trafficking, sexual assault, and child sexual assault. So you're in the water with other people now. You're getting in in the dirty places because you're familiar with them to help bridge them out. I feel like I'm called to reach down and pull up five-year-old me, 10-year-old me, 20-year-old me, 40-year-old me, um, and give just a a hand to help pull them out. But again, they have to pull back. Yeah. They have to want it. So you're it. I mean, this is, this happened three years ago, the hospital floor. It'll, you'll never forget, right? I mean, it's, it was so powerful in your life and so transformative in, in an instant, practically. Um, but that was about three years ago. So this way of life is still, still young. It's still new. You're, you, got a, you got a lot of, to use a little bit of a religious term, you got a lot of ministry ahead of you still. Sure. Which is a little exciting because in my time in ministry and my ministry is sitting across the table from people like you and having conversations like this, which is like an incredible blessing. I found it to be like an adventure as well. It's, it's, um, (laughs) it's, it's been transformative and shaping for me in my life. But if you had to take, I mean, because everything that's happened up until now has been really powerful right it's not been a a mundane sort of average life for Heidi it's been it's been super dark super light and um so with that if God said Heidi I'm going to take you tomorrow you come to heaven tomorrow but I'm going to give you one chance to deliver a message to people based on your experience. 
What is it? Hmm, I've never thought about that. Like God's real. I don't know. That's really the first, if I'm going with the very first thing, is that God's real. And that God's love. God is love. That's really what it. That's really what it is. I could say all these other lofty things, but that at the end of the day, that is. That is it. God is real. And give him a chance. <laughs> but you got to choose him. It's just that he's just, ugh, he's waiting. And it's that part. He's, and he's just waiting. And then he's never, he's never left. Like, you can leave him, but he doesn't leave. This is an incredible conversation for me. And um, there are, some really powerful truths about God and his nature that can seem contradictory to religious tradition that you just shared. <laughs> I could feel it. And it was exciting, and it was the Holy Spirit, and it was like... Yes, that is the presence of God. And you spoke it so well. I may be unsure about a lot of things in my life, but I'm sure about him. <laughs> There's a lot of questions I have about my life, but... I question a lot of religious stuff. <laughs> I do that. But him and my relationship with him, I don't question. In fact, I, I, I say this a lot. If I'm, if I'm standing butt naked in the middle of a street with no shoes and nothing on my body, with a tornado headed straight towards me, no home, no vehicle, no children, no husband, no family, no pets, no food, no nothing, nothing to my name, just me standing there with a tornado headed towards me. If him and I, God and I are good, the rest of it's just a blessing anyways. Because I have shoes, I have clothes, I have these things. So the rest of it's just a blessing. But if that is okay, nobody can take that from me. Everything else can be taken from me. But my relationship with him, nobody can take. Nobody. And so whenever I'm going through a storm, because there's storms in the last three years, it's not been easy, because I immediately jumped, as soon as that happened, I jumped right into trying to help other people out. It's not been easy, but I know as long as that is okay, the rest of it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. It's as long as him and I are good. Religion doesn't matter. What people say about me doesn't matter. I've had a, a crazy past. There's a lot of people that say things. And it doesn't matter because I'm his. He's, he chose me even when I was like that. He was still choosing me. I just had to choose him back. And I know that. Think of that day on the hospital floor. It's almost like It's almost like the birth that you'd never had before. It's like you were born that day. It, 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 that's what it is. In fact, I'm writing my book um, titled I See You. Um, but I'm writing that, and that's about his perspective of seeing me through all of that. And I kept praying. This was the, this, the last few months, a few months ago. And I'm praying, God, show me where do I start my book? Where do I start it? And audibly, when I woke you up, when you, when you woke up, when I woke you up, 
when you woke up. I'm like, what is that? And I'm realizing I'm praying this prayer on December 3rd. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, when I, when he woke, that's, I mean, it, it when it hit me it, and that's where I started my book was that hospital floor. So, and just revisiting all the things that changed me where I was born into the world, but not into him. Man, what a powerful experience that was. All the things you described about that. Um, the whole life review thing. A lot of people, when they have near-death experiences, get a life review where they see it all in, yeah. in a, I mean, the whole thing in, in a pretty short amount of time, almost in an instant. But they see it. You got one of those. You got deliverance. You got healing. You got cleansing. You got like <laughs> the laundry list of spiritual things that occur throughout different times in people's lives. And <laughs> it was the package deal like right there in some window of minutes. That is just awesome. <laughs> it's, a, it's awesome to me. I think it's beautiful. And I love that you have that story. You have that experience to share. Like I said, things can be taken from you, but that's something that can't ever be taken from me. I am thankful for all the seeds that were planted along the way. I'm very thankful for that and people that were in my life, you know, that were planting seeds and loving me through it. And I'm th I'm very thankful, and I, and I can see how how God set it up. I can see that, too. I can reflect back and say, he was trying so hard right here. He was trying to get me right here. He was, tr mm. he was trying the whole time. Yeah. But the, those moments where I'm like, goodness, he was really, really trying. He was really trying to get my attention right here. And, oh, he put this person in my life right here. And that person, that praying person, I mean, there's plenty of times where I can say, if that hadn't happened just like this, I wouldn't be here. If that hadn't happened just like this, and that's God. And that's God. It's like man makes horrible decisions and evil sin and all of that happens. And he goes, watch this. And he puts this person here. And he's like, watch this. I'm going to do this with this. And I can see how he's turned everything into good. And I see it over and over again. And... In fact, when things go wrong, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to see what he does with this. <laughs> I mean, I, and I have well, you get, such faith. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly what it is. You get into a place, you've had enough experience with his presence and the way he moves and his nature that it gives you the faith to know that, I mean, it's assurance. Faith is assurance. Yeah. It's not believing in something you don't have proof for. It's just the opposite. It's <laughs> To me, it's having such confidence yeah a lot of that is rooted in experience it's like i've just been down this road too many times i've seen him do it too many times yeah and i just know and i get ex i'm like oh so that didn't go the way i planned it so god's got a better plan than i have anyways and i'm just gonna i can't wait to see what he does with this not that i don't ever get apprehensive or oh, how is this going to turn out but really i just know i just trust him and i just know it's going to be okay and some people are like are you not mad at god Whenever, like, you know, when you get mad at God, I'm like, no, even throughout it all, even throughout everything we talked about, I don't reflect back and say, oh, I felt like God wasn't there. I don't, I don't have that. I know a lot of people that's part of their testimony of how mad they were, how they hated God and all this kind of stuff. That is not even throughout all of it. That is not part of my testimony. Mm. I just, I'm, I've had gratefulness and I'm thankful have I been depressed and anxious? Not in the last three years, I haven't. Um, I just, that isn't part of my testimony. I'm not mad at God. And I and I never was because I know I wouldn't be here. You just see where he was along the way. I know he sustained me. Yeah. And I know that he, I know he's like, watch this. I know that, I, I know that. I know he's done that three years ago in my life. He was like, watch this. And everyone Everyone watched. <laughs> yeah. And he's going to do it again. Oh, yeah. And so you just know that is powerful. All of it's powerful. 
is so powerful. <laughs> this is one of the, one of the most amazing stories of God's beauty and faithfulness that have been on here, and um, just super thankful that you have um, committed yourself to sharing how how beautiful that was. Um, certainly in contrast to how awful it was before. It's just um, just sitting here in awe and humility at this whole thing and um, and thankful for you and thankful for what's ahead for you and deeply desiring you to experience the fulfillment of your joy in his presence. Thankful for the opportunity to to tell people about my father. Heidi's story is both shocking and beautiful. Beautiful in how God shielded her from the worst of the atrocities that happened to her and washed her spiritually clean after decades of torment. Shocking in that such things could ever happen to her, even as a small child. We praise God that Heidi is free and living a life bearing fruit for the kingdom of heaven. But there are countless children living in Heidi's situation right now. God radically transformed Heidi, but Heidi's freedom started with someone making a call to report it. To report possible human trafficking, call 888-373-7888 or text the word INFO, that's I-N-F-O, to 233-733. Someone's life likely depends on it.